Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I've set honey out to graze, and we're going to talk about our new verse-by-verse -verse study through First and Second Thessalonians. I don't know how long that's going to take. Could take up to a year, or a little less than a year. So it could take us up to spring of 2021. So I invite you to follow us along as we go through the study of God's Word as we feast upon His Word together. Father, we come into Your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. We come with great thanksgiving for another privilege that You've given us to feast upon Your Word together as we await Your glorious appearing. May all of us come to this study with the realization that it's, it's You who speaks to us. You who have given us Your Word. We're so very grateful, very thankful that we have that opportunity to study Your Word, to look diligently at it, to strive to know what You want us to know. May the Holy Spirit take charge of this time, filtering out the foolishness and the ignorance, but sealing to our hearts the truth of Your Word, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi again, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're beginning a long road down two amazing uh, and I believe relevant epistles as we await our Lord's return. First and second Thessalonians, verse by verse. It's been five days, I believe, since my last video, which was the prophecy update, and it's taken that long for me to really do justice to the first four verses of chapter one of First Thessalonians, to feel comfortable enough to talk about it. Many of you who have followed this channel and followed our teaching verse by verse through Paul's epistles know that I've stressed before in past studies, and I have to stress it again, that this is God's Word. It is not Paul's Word or the, the word of Silvanus or, uh, or Timothy, Timotheus. It's God's Word. And it's the Holy Spirit who's leading Paul. In fact, not only is he leading Paul, but he fitted Paul over the years to write what he did. Now that's a, that's a whole, there's a whole sermon in that, just that, that fact alone. The same fact applies in your life. He's fitted you prepared you, equipped you, trained you for the work that He's now doing in and through your life. Now that, that's true whether you realize that or not. That's true of you and that's true of me. So it's God who speaks to us. In most of the epistles, we read the same thing. We read grace and peace. Do we really understand that God showered grace on us when we were His enemies, when we were not seeking Him, when we were not working for Him? That's my question to you. So many Christians believe that we receive grace when we receive Him. That's just not true. And because it was in that condition, He, he showered grace on us. As we saw in our study through Romans, uh, chapter 5, it was when we were His enemies that we were reconciled to God. How? By our acceptance? No. By the death of His Son. Why? The answer is simple, folks. It was because we are His children. We always were His children. We didn't just suddenly become His children by some act of uh, obedience on our part. We were always God's children. We might, have been, we might have been far from Him. We may have been the son in the far country, but we were a son. All of you who are listening here, those of you who know the Lord Jesus Christ, are His children and have always been His children and that's the wonderful text that we have as we look at the opening of this chapter in 1 Thessalonians. In the first verse, we're told that not only was it the grace of God, but it's the peace that comes to us from God our Father 
and the Lord Jesus Christ, both. And that's not our peace with God. It's the fact that He is at peace with us. And I want you to think of that, dearly beloved. God has nothing against you. God is at peace with you. Now, theologically, we call that propitiation. Propitiation means that as far as you and your sin is, is concerned, God is completely satisfied. So do you understand that? Have you been taught that? Are you being taught that marvelous truth? Dearly beloved, He is completely satisfied. What satisfied Him? Was it, was it your obedience, your repentance, your acceptance, the way that you live? Of course not. Absolutely not. That would be a terrible and imperfect product. No, what satisfied Him, folks, was the blood of Christ. That by the blood of His cross, as, as we read in Colossians 1, you, you are presented holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. And we should know these things, as the text will go on here and point out. Romans tells us that He was delivered, and, and the word there is, is dia. He was delivered because of our offenses. Why did Christ die on the cross? Did He die on the cross to make a, a possibility available to anyone who might just reach out and take it? Absolutely not. He was delivered because of our offenses. Folks, it has to do with His family. It's much more personal than that. Who is the word our, O-U-R, referring to? It's referring to His people. He wasn't delivered for everybody's offenses. And before we've even settled into this epistle, before we've even really got started, well, I've probably lost a few of you. But what the text is teaching us, folks, is the truth. The Word of God is very specific. Our offenses. He was delivered because of them. Christ didn't go to the cross so that He might make something possible to anybody who who just might like to avail themselves of it. First of all, they couldn't because they were spiritually dead. He went to the cross because of our offenses. And whoever they are, that's who He died for. We learned at the end of chapter 4 of Romans, and He was raised again because of our justification, our being made righteous. His deliverance for our offenses was sufficient to declare us righteous. You read it differently in, in Corinthians. He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. How righteous are you? The righteousness of God. Have you learned that fact? Has that fact, that truth, settled into your life? Has it incorporated your life? And I emphasize the word fact. Where's the great conflict in modern theological thinking? You're not getting more righteous every day. Christ did not do an insufficient work on the cross. He was delivered for our offenses and we were justified. We were not justified because we received it, believed it, accepted it, declared Him Lord over our life, repented or anything else as modern evangelism might try to lead you to believe. We were declared righteous because and only because He had been delivered for our offenses. So it's on that basis that we have peace with God and we can therefore understand what we are reading here as we begin this epistle. That's the propitiation that we have with God. God is propitiated. We're not. We don't have to be satisfied because of sin. God is totally, absolutely, completely, 100% satisfied as far as your righteousness is concerned. And that satisfaction is based entirely on the obedience of Jesus Christ. But, There is today, in these times that we're living, as, as, as it's always been, I, I believe it's more today than it was back then. It's always been that way, this way. But even more so today, that 
there's a desperate attempt to make the human the one responsible. You know, you're captain of your ship. You're a control of your, uh, of your destiny. And such garbage as that. Folks, you can't take someone headed for hell today and say that if they accept Christ, he died for their sins. He, he's already died. And the ones he died for are our, okay? That's the ones that he died for are the our of Romans 4. He died for our sins, our offenses. We read in Matthew he, that he came to, to deliver his people from their sins. Our trespasses are forgiven, completely forgiven because of His death. Do you, do you know that you're forgiven? Fully, completely forgiven. That the sin issue has been entirely forever settled. Do you know that? Folks, these are wonderful truths. We stand holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Truths, no doubt, that have caused great rebellion among humans. You know, I, not so. Steve, not so. Not, that can't be true. I want it to be because I did something. I believed. I received. I recognized. I was a sinner. I did something about it. I, 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 I. And it becomes all about I. All, all about me. All about oneself, not Christ. It's one of the reasons, folks, why I deliver these messages to you the way that I do. I don't focus on me, my horse, my chickens, my ducks, my dogs, my or anything else. It's all about Him, not us. The, don't expect these videos to be flashy, okay? They're not going to be. But if you want to understand these wonderful truths, then take the time to listen. But don't just listen to me. Don't just listen to me. S see if these things be, be so, if what I'm telling you is true. Amazing how simple a truth that, that these, these truths are. That, you know, that every person claiming to know Christ would, 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 you know, that they would just easily grasp, you know, that difference between self and Christ, and, and Christ you know, but between Him and the I, you know, me. You know, it seems so simple. But it takes the Holy Spirit to open up one's eyes from, and remove that blindness to see this truth. God's children were dead in sin. They died in Adam. They died in their own sin. And God became man. He became our kinsman redeemer. He died in our place. He died for us. So, so all of the us who were dead in sin are alive in Christ because of what He did. And as a result, God is completely satisfied. Amazing. I don't know how many Christians have said to me over the years, Steve, you know, oh, you know if you only knew the sin that I, I committed, you know, how terrible that it was. I don't want to know. I don't want to know the sin that you committed. I don't have to know. Don't need to know. Worthless knowledge as far as I'm concerned. Because the sin issue between you and God has been forever settled. What is of value is our knowing God says He's cast it behind His back, buried it in the deepest sea, sought for, not found, remembered no more, covered by the blood, forgiven and forgotten. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus, which cannot in your new nature sin. That, that's where Christ abides in you. You're sinless new man because He can't be, tu he can't be touched by sin. Christ intended to come and live in you, but it had to be a sinless new creation for Him to abide in. He cannot be tainted by sin. His seed abides in Him and they cannot sin, says John. They have no ability to sin in the new creation. The old creation, the old man, it doesn't do anything but that. And God has nothing to do with it. He has nothing to do with the flesh. God is totally satisfied. That is a wonderful truth. We have peace with God. We have peace with God because of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Verse 2, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. And folks, I had to ask, you know, when I came across this verse, what are... What are these three making mention of? 
Oh, I know it refers to the Thessalonian church. I know who it's referring to, but what are they making mention of? I believe we answer that question by looking at what we just read. That's how I make mention of you. When I make mention of you in my prayers, it's in the context, okay, the context of these truths. Verse 4, remembering without ceasing. And let's look at these, these four things. Your work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. Faith, ho love, hope. And, and I'm going to boldly suggest that what Paul refers to as, as theirs, which is said, the Thessalonians, which is said to be in the sight of God our Father, is, is indeed theirs. It was indeed theirs. It's indeed ours. It's a possession given us. But it is ours only because it became ours solely by grace, based upon the person and work of Christ, nothing that we did in which God is at peace with us. Our work of faith is not our trusting in ourselves, but God, and that is what I, we glory in. That is what I give thanks in for you all as well as for me. I believe that to be what the text is saying. Our labor of love is, is certainly not according to law, and, and, and being that the word patience means enduring, that is, a hope that endures. Well, no wonder. It, you know, it's a guaranteed expectation, hope. It's not wishful thinking. That's what endures. That is what God, through our brethren, these human writers, is remembering without ceasing. And I find that amazing because I'm seeing myself in there when I read that. Because that's, that's, how, I, that's how I think of you. That's how I remember you. That's how I give thanks. That's what I give thanks for. And it should be vice versa. That's what is in the sight of God. That, that is what God looks at, folks. Okay? Might not be what we always look at, but it is what God looks at. Well, as you can see, I'm outdoors today. It's a bright, sunny day here in southeastern Oklahoma. It's, uh, it's probably in the 90s. Uh, I'm sweating a little bit. Uh, I wouldn't be out here without a hat because my head would get baked. So normally I wouldn't be wearing a hat, but you just get kind of tired of doing this stuff in your study. And especially when the weather gets nice, you want to get out. So I'm out here at Sugarloaf Mountain Creek. Uh, if folks, if labor of love doesn't describe motive, I don't know what motive is. We get down to the fourth verse, knowing Brethren, beloved, your election of God. Now we, now we do need to look at the grammar. I need to know whether it's past tense, future tense, present tense. You know, then maybe I can understand what God is saying to me here. These are simple words. There isn't anything dark and mysterious in God's Word. You don't have to be a Greek scholar to understand this. A lot of this comes across just even in the English translations. What is He saying? knowing it is a perfect tense that is a tense that expresses or stresses the present remaining reality of a completed past action something happened in the past with the with the results of that action continuing on in the present that's the perfect tense god almighty is saying not paul this is god's word our loving heavenly father says you know this now because you've known it completely in the past that you're loved that's how i'm reading it that you're loved and my question to you right off right away is would be if do you realize just how much god loves you if you don't know that god loves you then I, i've got to scratch my head and say you know have you ever read this book what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of god we love him because why he first loved us these are simple statements of truth in the word of god 
I have loved you with an everlasting love. If you don't know this, you've never read this book. So this perfect tense of verse 4 says to me, the Holy Spirit expects that we have read His Word, that we are totally satisfied that He loves us, and we are, and we are stressing the present reality of that past complete understanding. That's the motive. The, the meaning behind the words labor of love. Not our love for God, but His love for us. His love for us. Sometimes our love will fail. It's that in, uninterrupted knowledge of knowing that His love for us never fails, folks. So we ought to know this. The Holy Spirit expects us to know this because He's made it abundantly clear. We know now, based upon the past total realization, that God loves us. Now, I can't leave that word because, you know, somebody's going to say, well, Steve, I know, he did, I know He did love me, but, you know, maybe you know, at one time, but I'm not so sure now. I, you just, you don't know what I've done. Folks, I don't want to know. Are you saying that there is some sin in your life for which Christ did not die? He's not going to be made sin again, folks. He was made sin for every sin in your life. Every sin that you ever committed was future. When He planted wheat, He didn't plant wheat you know, that became tare. He didn't plant tare that became wheat. He planted wheat that grew up wheat and will be harvested as wheat, and, and somebody else planted the tare. Satan did that. God didn't do that. Satan did. But God knows His own. Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. So all of Satan's children will be rooted up. But you were always God's child. Your sins were always forgiven long before you ever even thought about committing them. We know that we are brethren. That's the next word in, in the verse. In verse 4, we are brethren. Behold, what manner of love God has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God. Sons and daughters of God. We are brothers and sisters. When you look at someone who doesn't know near as much Scripture as you do and, and lives what you think is a rotten life, do you understand that if they are God's, He died for them in the same way He died for you? That He loves them to the same extent which He loves you. God doesn't have some supreme love for the top 5% of Christians. And then our next word is beloved. It's a perfect passive in the Greek. Knowing, brethren, you're beloved. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us. It's a passive voice. He loved us. Perfect tense. He loved us completely. And we know that because He died in our place, that we're fully forgiven. His love is everlasting. We're brothers and sisters. What, what greater love could there be, folks? How could you ever expect any greater love than that? When you didn't love Him, when you were not seeking Him, when you were not living for Him, He died for you. We've always been loved by God. And now we come to the words, your election of God, and now we've hit a word that bothers so many people. And it shouldn't. They just shouldn't. Steve, I'm not going to sit and listen to that hellish doctrine of election. You know, they, that's what they say when we're looking at the present reality that, that we know that we are loved, that we know that we're chosen by God. I don't understand, to me, folks, I don't understand why that seems so horrible to a lot of, of people. People talk about foreknowledge and election and predestination as if those don't exist in the Word of God when we are the elect of God. You can't say that that's just Israel. Okay? Can't do it. You won't find one verse to substantiate the idea that that is referring to a different class of people other than the Christians that he's speaking to at the church of Thessalonica. Okay? Alright? 
God's people during this present age of grace. We are the elect of God. Okay? If you're one of His people, you are His elect, whether you want to believe that or not. Sorry, but you're His elect. doesn't make any difference whether you want to be His elect or not. You are His elect. He chose you. You didn't choose Him. Now, you can go on thinking that you chose Him, but you'll be lying against the truth. And I, for the one, I, I can't, for the life of me, I can't figure out why anybody would want to not, to not, would not want to believe the truth concerning that fact. I, I think it's a wonderful fact that He chose me, because I know that if He had not, I would have never chose Him. Never. Never. That I know for a fact. This is the dominant theme in, in all of Scripture, and yet it's hated by the vast majority of Christians today. Romans 1, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for His name, among whom you are also the called, the elect of Jesus Christ. How does He call us? Through His Word. Knowing you are brethren, knowing you are loved by God, knowing you are chosen by God, I think that's wonderful. I'm glad He chose me. Our Lord said bluntly to His disciples, You did not choose me, I chose you, and I am thrilled that God chose me. I'm astounded that He chose me. There surely wasn't anything in me that would cause Him to choose me. And that's one of the problems that Christians have. When I hear Christians say, Well, I just can't understand why God loves me. I, I got to say, now wait a minute. What you're saying is that there ought to be a reason in you that God loves you, and there isn't. God doesn't love you because you're worthy of being loved. God doesn't love you because you serve Him. He doesn't love you because you believe Him. He doesn't love you because of anything that you do. God loves you because you're His. He chose you. He elected you. He called you. 1 Corinthians 1, unto the church of God, which is in Corinth. Here's another church, folks to them that are set apart in Christ Jesus, called saints. They're set apart in Christ Jesus. The reason you're a saint is because you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. And they didn't set themselves apart. That's a passive voice. Galatians 1, I marvel that you are so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ. Of course we're called. Of course we're chosen. Ephesians 1, according as He hath chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. When did He choose you? Did He choose you? It, what is that text saying, folks? Is it saying that he, cho he chose you when you accepted Him, when you believed on Him, repented, or any other thing? No. He chose you before the foundation of the world to make, to make you holy without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His own will. How could He say it any stronger? And people say, this is a doctrine of demons. It's a hellish doctrine. This doctrine of election. This damnable doctrine of election. How absolutely marvelous to know that God loved me before He created the heavens and the earth, that He knew me before there ever was an Adam and an Eve, and that He predetermined that Christ would die in my place to cover my sin debt so that He would be completely satisfied with me. It is, it's a chain, folks, a chain of one truth after another that takes and, and transforms our lives. It's God's election. Not your choosing God, but God choosing you. I'm glad He chose me. I'm certain I wouldn't have chosen. I was a sinner wanting to go my own way. Just think of the father and the prodigal son. He was in the far country. He was separated from his father, but he was still a son. The fact that the father says that he's dead doesn't mean he's, he's in hell. Doesn't mean he's headed for hell. It means that he's dead physically. Uh, that is, would, to say that, that he's dead physically is stupid. To say that he's dead spiritually is stupid, okay? It means that he's not in fellowship with his father, but he's his son. I think many of God's children will go to heaven and virtually never know that in their life. 
Never having that confidence, folks. Imagine never having that confidence and then standing before Him at the judgment seat of Christ. Go back and watch my last three videos on that. The Holy Spirit says, one of the things that we remember that shores up our understanding of work, of faith, and labor, of love, and enduring hope in times of difficulty is knowing, absolutely knowing, that God loves us, that He chose us. And we have just barely begun our study in this epistle. I want to thank you all once again for all of your messages, the wonderful messages that I read recently on the last video, all your messages of encouragement and support, and especially for your prayers for this ministry. I thank you all for your support. You know who you are. Until next time, this is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.